Um, but I also want to sort of give you a. Uh, is it frightening to be pointed at with the laser pointer? I don't know. Yes. People get arrested for like putting these things at helicopters or something. Yeah. I don't know why. If I was flying a helicopter and I saw someone point a laser pointer at me, I would ignore them and continue to fly the helicopter. I, would, I think that's the strong move. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about RAID, but I also want to sort of give you a little bit of a segue into how to look at systems research papers. Right? This is a, and, and really, again, at this point in the semester, you guys should be prepared to look at stuff like this. And this is a nice paper to start with for a couple of reasons. First reason is it's a good paper. Right? Um, there aren't a lot of research papers that give birth to, I don't know, is, is RAID a billion dollar industry? It probably is, right? Think about all the companies that make controllers and software for, and hardware RAID solutions. So, I mean, this is, you know, it's not very often that somebody, you know, in an academic research lab writes something down on a piece of paper and then shows it to other people and it gives birth to this whole sort of sector of technology. Right? How many people ever use RAID for anything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys, you, you may be using it without knowing it. Some of the, uh, the shared uh, network mounts that you guys use may use RAID underneath, you know, behind the scenes. Um, but, but this is a neat idea, all right? So we'll go through this sort of more linearly than I might normally if I was, you know, asking you guys to read a research paper. Just sort of look at a little bit at the anatomy of it. Um, but there's some, there's some pretty neat insights in here, and conceptually RAID is, is, is a pretty cool idea, right? Sorry. Um, all right. <laughs> so, the so this is and 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 again, like if you unfortunately, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. I mean, I get to read a lot of cool papers. So that's a cool part of my job. But there aren't a lot of research papers that you read that that start off with this degree of sort of I don't know what bra bravura, perhaps, right? Uh, David Patterson, who is uh, super famous. Actually, all these guys are very famous. Right? David Patterson, Garth Gibson, uh, Randy Katz, all all very well known at this point. Mainly, uh, possibly, RAID was what sort of got their names out there in the first place, right? Uh, but David Patterson in particular, I remember Margot Seltzer used to say that, you know, he was, when, when she looked at his work, he was the master at crafting these introductions to papers that really were just so earth-shatteringly compelling and also obvious, right, that it sort of made everyone else feel ashamed for working on the wrong problem, right? <laughs> like, if I, man, how did I miss the boat, right? Like, this is clearly the most important thing affecting the future of computing and potentially mankind, right? Because <laughs> our futures are entwined at this point, right? So, and, and this paper is a nice example, right? It's, it's not, you know, and, and, you know, to some degree when you read research papers like this, since you guys are computer scientists, you know, I, I know clearly it's a small group today because I, I, had, I gave an assignment that involved the word read, right? <laughs> um, but you guys will have to write things, right? Write things that are not computer code, right? Write things that are designs that you're hoping somebody else will actually be able to build. Or write things that are descriptions of new ideas that you hope that somebody like a boss or someone with money, like a, you know, a an old rich guy who doesn't know much about technology and is thinking, oh, maybe he'll invest a few million dollars in your new startup, right? So you guys are gonna have to convince people of that the things you do are cool. Not enough to just you know, sit in your room and hack away, right? That's usually not how people change things in technology. You have to persuade people. And this is a very nice example of, of sort of persuasion, right? Um, so the context for this, I'm embarrassed to say I don't, I don't remember what the date of this paper is. 1987, 1987, I was eight years old. Um, and right off the bat, you know, uh, he identifies, so, so what motivates, I won't, I won't tell you, I sort of asked a question, I mean, what is the motivation behind this paper? We, we talked about this in class, yeah. Well, no, I, I think that those are aspects that he looks at when they, or they look at when they analyze their solutions. But what's the problem? What is the big, obvious problem that no one has been working on? Yeah. The um, bottleneck of the system. Which is, which is what? The performance of this one really large disk. Right. So the single, the sled, right? The single, large, expensive disk, right? It makes it sound so 
I don't know, slut, I said some, something pejorative about that term, despite the fact it's not really supposed to be, right? So this, the IO crisis, right? In fact, I think there's a section in it called Depending IO Crisis, right? Which is like four sentences of which three of which are a restatement of Amdahl's law, right? And then he's like, so obviously this, right? It's pretty awesome. I told Guru, I was like, man, it's harder to write research papers now, or that's what it seems like. <laughs> because yeah, it was like, here's Amdahl's law, and now I applied it to disks, and there's the problem, right? Um, so again, abstract, um, this is great. Increasing performance of CPUs and memories will be squandered, right? squandered. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's a strong word, if not matched by an IO, increase in IO performance, right? Um, you know, essentially, you know, I have these big disks, the big disks aren't getting fast very, very quickly, and so let's try something else, right? So the, I'm going to scroll down a ways here because of the beautiful formatting of this paper. Ah, here we go, right? So this is cool. You know, if, if you read some of the introduction, as the paper goes on, you know, uh, some of the, you know, I, I wish there were more pictures in this paper uh, that would have helped in places. Um, but at the, the beginning, it's very clear, right? This is, this is a very compact introduction. Um, he's talking about, this is what was known as Joy's Law, um, which is saying that essentially microprocessors are getting faster, right? What, what does this introduction say? Um, now, where, where does Amdahl, who we'd heard of before, although he didn't have a first name until he read this paper, right? Um, what, what did he say about memory capacity? What's, what's his, it's right up on the slide, right? What was his rule of thumb? Again, this is 1987, right? In order to keep a system balanced, how much memory do I need? Each CPU instruction per second requires one byte of memory. How many people's systems obey that rule today? Apply that rule to your current system. Who's got a laptop? How many gigahertz is that processor? Uh, 2.7. 2.7, okay. We'll round to two because it doesn't really matter. All right, two, two gigahertz processor. So if I have two gigahertz of processing, that's two, and, and, and that's actually probably, probably the clock speed. So the number of instructions it's executing is probably a little bit lower than that, but let's just ignore that because pipelining might help us, whatever. Who cares? It's an <laughs> estimate, right? How many bytes of memory would I need on this system, according to Gene Omdahl? Yeah. 2 GB. 2 GB. How many do you have? Uh, four. Four. Yeah, there we go. So, so actually, I mean, most of us, and, and he actually hints at this, most of us actually have more memory than, than we need, given the speed of our CPUs. I think I have like 64 gigabytes on my, on my desktop. Um, but you know, I mean, this was, this was before multi-core, so maybe you have to multiply by four or eight or whatever it is. Yeah. What's that? Does the core number of cores doesn't matter? Cores? It's 1987, right? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> this, this, this does not anticipate the emergence of multi-core multi processing. Not, not quite, right? But sure, yeah, you can maybe multi. I don't know how you would update this, right? But this is great. Um, this is like now some sort of like canonicized rule in 1987. You know, when he gets down a little bit, a little bit further, he says, well, there is no famous formula, right? Imagine if you came up with this famous formula. Right? You feel, feel pretty good about yourself. Um, so, and, and again, so now, you know, now it's, it's because of the rapid drop in memory prices, we're actually seeing machines that are shipped with alphas of three, right? Meaning that about three times as much memory as required by, by this Amdahl's law, right? Um, so we get to the bottom here and it says, I like this, common sense tells us that secondary storage must keep place, right? Of course. Um, and, and then we get to my favorite section of the whole paper. Um, yeah, you don't need to worry about this. Although this was interesting, right? One of the reasons, one of the things that's interesting that was helping memory keep pace is caches, right? You know, bigger uh, and more sort of uh, pro pro caches that are close to the processor, right? All right, yada, yada, yada. The, the improvement of sleds has only improved at a modest rate. Does anyone remember how, how fast seek times were improving? <laughs> seek times were improving, right? But, but at what rate? 
Something like seven, I think he quotes 7% a year. And then he says there's no reason to expect a faster rate in the near future. Right? So what, what was the solution that, that systems were starting to use? It starts to sound like the lead up to another system we talked about this semester. If I have, if memory is cheap and my disk is slow, what do I do? Throw a cache at it. How do I do that? What is the cache that I throw at it? Right, I run a buffer cache of memory to try to soak up as much disk IO as possible. Why, why does he argue that this doesn't work? What, what kind of, what are there two, several types of workloads that he claimed were not going to interact well with the cache? What was one of them? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so like a high, you know, I, I, don't, I, I would really love to have known what David Patterson considered to be high performance computing in 1987. Right, um, but whatever. I mean, you you know, lower numbers are graphs for massive amounts of data, maybe like a gigabyte or two. Right, um, you know, it's like the size of the movie that you downloaded off of BitTorrent now. Right, um, so what was the other? What's the other type of workload? That sounds a little speculative to me. Give it, yeah. Yeah, so transaction processing systems and, and databases in particular right, have, have, don't necessarily have great locality. Right? We talked about how if I have good locality on the disk, the buffer cache helps a lot because a lot of my disk accesses are actually going to be soaked up by the buffer cache. If I don't, then I'm in trouble. Right? So again, and, and this is now my favorite part of the paper. It's three, it's, I don't know, we should count the number of sentences. It's only four or five. The pending I.O. crisis. Right? Um, what is the impact of improving the performance of some pieces of a problem while leaving the others the same. I get, you know, bounded speed up, right? This is Amdahl's law, coined apparently in 1967, right? Um, so he states Amdahl's law, and then he says, if some, if an app, some hypothetical app, spent 10% of its time doing I/O, then as the other parts of the system improve, that bottleneck starts to dominate. Right, v very simple. Right, simply if we don't, if I/O doesn't keep up with the rest of the system, I/O becomes the entire performance bottleneck. Right. Um, all right. So, so what? So what is the solution? RAID. Right. <laughs> okay. Great. Right. So, but but what's but what's interesting about RAID? Right. I mean, what what is you know if you had to say what's the big What's the big idea of this paper, right? Like we've done the buildup. I/O is a problem. What's the big idea here? Right? Yeah, I mean, if I had to take one thing away from this paper, I would say that it can be more effective to build a high-performance system using a lot of easily replaceable pieces. If it's constructed well, then using one big, you know, disproportionately expensive system. Where else do we see this applied today in the world of computing? This is not, yeah. Yeah, I mean, almost every service you use in the cloud, right? I mean, when, when Google was starting up, they actually bought commodity machines. So Google would order tens of thousands of Dells, literally. I mean, that's what, now, now they've moved on, you know, now they make their own, you know, I think they, they have their own hardware that's made to spec, right, based on their workloads. That's what happens when you get big and expensive and rich, right? Um, but, but also, I mean, to some degree, that's the right solution. But, but when they were starting out, they would fill their data centers with these commodity Dell machines, right? There's a nice thing about commodity Dell machines, they're cheap, right? They did a lot of research to figure out exactly which ones to buy. Actually, so they looked at their workloads and they figured out the right combination of different parameters. But they were buying off-the-shelf hardware, not just off-the-shelf, because you can buy a server off-the-shelf. Well, I don't know where, what shelf there are servers on, but some Amazon warehouse, right? <laughs> um, but they were buying commodity sort of uh, machines that were really designed to be to be user-facing, right? And they were using them to create these big performant clusters, right? So, so that's that's someone who does. And to some degree, that's still what they're doing. I mean, there's no single machine that you could buy that would replace the Google search engine, right? But, you know, at some, at some point, you can't even make the, the sled as fast and as, as performant as you want. You have to start using other things, right? So this approach, to some degree, really anticipates a lot of, a lot of modern computing, which is pretty cool. Um, all right, so, you know, the next thing we do is we look at a performance comparison. I love this, the Fujitsu Super Eagle. 
you know, <laughs> probably followed up by the great eagle, right, and then potentially the bald eagle, um, and then the, yeah, the, this, this one I like to the AK-4, right, you know, like it just needs one more letter, right, and then it's a much, <laughs> much, one more number, and that's a much more interesting device, uh, in some, some, some sense. Um, so, and, and you know, I mean, it, you don't need to study this table carefully, but essentially what, what they, what they, what the, he's trying to point out here is that these sleds are disproportionately expensive for what you're buying, right? You're getting better performance, fine, but you're paying, you may, maybe you're getting a factor of two better performance, but you're paying a factor of eight, maybe, for that performance. And so the performance per dollar of the cheap inexpensive disks, which were probably really expensive, actually, at the time, um, the, the performance per dollar was not, was, was not as good, right? And then, you know, yeah, hopefully you guys didn't slog through too much of the stuff about SCSI. That's not really that interesting. Um, except, except just to say that you could do this, right? I mean, the SCSI part is sort of a feasibility, right? There's no need for the controller to change, right? The disk had these embedded controllers, and so if I, if I write some, some intelligent software or some intelligent hardware, I can control big groups of disks, right? All right, caveats. There's a one, one paragraph uh, group of caveats, including the fact that they're not going to discuss cabling and packaging, which I would thought was sort of merciful. Um, I've never seen a computer systems paper that has a section on cabling and packaging before. Um, so it's nice that this wasn't the first. So now, you know, so they've, they've built this up. They said, wow, you know, like we can, you know, these, these cheap devices are actually provide pretty good performance for the money. The problem is reliability. Right, so who, who can sort of explain the problem with using a bunch of replacing one sled with a bunch of cheap disks, right? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim that these disks will fail at the same rate, just for the sake of argument, yeah. Even if like, the probability of one disk failing is low, the fact that you're buying tons of them makes the probability of one among the disks failing high. Right, if, if, if there's a constant probability, right, that one of you at some point in this lecture, I don't know where to go with that, but whatever, <laughs> I don't know what to say, will just suddenly vanish, right, <laughs> then the more of you there are in here, the more likely it is that somebody will vanish, right? I'll just get so spun excited about rate that they'll just, you know, <laughs> you know they'll meet their antiparticles or whatever. Um, but that would be bad for us because we would be showered with a lot of radiation. So let's not do that. So I think, the prob I think there is actually a non-zero probability of that happening, but I think it's also very small, so we're probably safe. But the point is that the more of you guys that get together in the same room, the more likely it is that one, one of you will, will happen, right? And in big data centers, right? So when, when Google's building up these, and, and I'm certain this is true, I mean, I'm sure you can find published statistics about this, right? But, but my guess is that since we've started this lecture, Google's had dozens of machines fail, right? All over the place, right? Maybe in every one of their data centers, since I started talking, there's been a machine that's failed, right? Have you seen pictures of the data centers? They go on, they're like, you can't even see the wall, you know? It's like you feel like you could get lost in there and never come out again. Uh, maybe somebody is in there, actually. Um, <laughs> maybe that's why the machines are failing. They're trying to send us a signal. Um, the point is that, you know, you're, you know, the, the more, and this is happening constantly, right? And they've built up, you know, to some degree, like we talked about before, search is a very forgiving application, but they've built up tools to deal with these problems, right? But the more you put 10,000, 100,000 machines in a data center, they ain't gonna all last the first day, right? And, it's, uh, and once they start to age, they're gonna be failing all the time, right? So when, it, when a disk fails or a machine fails, somebody goes in, maybe it's a robot now, right? It certainly will be in the near future. They go to the rack where the failed machine is, they pull the machine out, they put the new machine in, and then they walk away, right? And actually, I think they're like trained to like walk on these very like, you know, like through the data, you know, this. Anyway, this is why they're gonna be replaced with robots. Um, <laughs> So, and, and that's how these large cloud computing services work, right? But they're failing all the time. And, and you, know, we, you know, you can walk through the math, but it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, this is sort of intuitive uh, to us, right? And so the problem is that if I don't do something about this, all, replacing all of this, you know, replacing the sled with 10 cheap drives is just gonna lead to all these failures, right? And now we start talking about rate, right? So now we've got to the point where he's, he's gonna start to explain 
how we actually accomplish this, right? And there are five RAID levels described in this paper. There are, I don't know, RAID vendors keep adding RAID levels, right? There's probably lots more. I don't know how many of them are like real things and just how many of them are marketing. Um, so there's, there's a RAID level that's missing, though, that's probably pretty common. Actually, does anyone know which one it is? Yeah. Yeah, and so what, what is RAID 0? No, you're getting close. Rate zero is pretty simple, actually. Yeah. What's that? So, but but how do I? So, well, maybe let's let's start with actually rate one. So, but he so the 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 in order to sort of set the scene, and we're not going to go through all the statistics and numbers. He talks about um, he defines some terminology here in terms of the number of disks per group, uh, how many you know how many groups we have, check disks, etc. But let's just talk through these sort of conceptually, right? So you guys get a sense of what it is, right? OK, let's see, right? And I can derive. And OK, so, so, the, so the nice thing is, right, if I introduce redundancy, so let's just talk about the effect of doing that, right? Because this is important. Let's say that my array can tolerate a failure, just for the sake, say, one, right? So one disk can fail. How does this address the reliability problem that we talked about before? Because eventually, the other disk is going to fail, and then I'm in trouble. So how do RAID arrays work around, the, RAID arrays work around this problem? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you could just move it to another location. <laughs> the whole array? <laughs> just get rid of the failed disk. OK, so I am going to get rid of the failed disk, right? That doesn't solve my problem. What do I need to do? Need to replace it, right? So the idea here is by tolerating a failure, right? Let's say that I, again, so these, these approaches allow a disk in the group to fail. Once a disk fails, though, what can happen? Another one can fail, Another one can fail right? And so if I'm unlucky, right? And this, this is all, you know, this math, you know, they, well, they walk through it. But this does not eliminate failures, right? What it does is two things, right? First of all, it allows me to tolerate the first failure. And second of all, it creates a window during which the, uh, the array, sometimes it's, it's, it's described, it's running in degraded mode, right? When it's in that mode, another failure may lead to data loss. So what defines the probability now that I'm actually going to lose data? Because certainly, again, I mean, the worst case scenario, what's the worst case scenario for, for a, a rate like this? Well, they could all fail at once, right? But you don't even need all, like two, right? Because actually, two would be worse. Because if they all fail, you're like, ah, wasn't well, my lucky day, right? If two fail, you're like, oh, gosh, you know? There's three that are still working, and yet all my data's gone. Very sad. Um, so yeah, if they all fail at once, you're essentially back to the sled scenario. But that's pretty unlikely. But if two fail almost at the same time, then I could still lose data. So as soon as one fails, uh, they, they define, so he, he talks about mean time to failure of the entire array. What's the other important parameter here that determines the effective reliability of the array? Yeah. Mean time to repair or mean time to recovery, right? How long does it take your lazy system administrator, right, to get out of bed into their car drive to work, go up to the server room, slide out the disk, put in a new one, right? What is, what is frequently done in, in really sort of important high performance rate arrays, right? The disk isn't replaced by a person. What happens? Isn't there like a, a spare one rate? Yeah. Over? Yeah, so I have what's called a hot backup or a hot standby, right? The hot standby drive is just sitting there, right? Basically, it's spun up, it's online, it's ready to go. It doesn't actually, it's not actually used until there's a failure, right? When there's a failure, the array will fail over onto the, immediately start using the, the spare, you know, start uh, using that to move data around to try to meet the redundancy requirements. Actually, I think, how, I'm not sure actually how this works. I think sometimes the hot, the hot standby is actually kept up to date with some data, so to, to reduce the overhead of a disk failing, right? But then the idea is then you get an email saying, OK, by the way, now your hot spare is gone, right? So it's time to go put a new one in, right? So I can work around these problems by buying more hardware, right? Why do I not care about buying more hardware for my RAID array? 
What? Because they're inexpensive disks, right? This isn't the uh, redundant array of sleds, right? These are cheap, so I just buy a bunch of them, no problem, right? Although, actually, I've been, f I've been fantasizing recently about creating a RAID array using big flash drives just to see how awesome it would be, Because right? um, I've got stuff that's so IO bound, it's very sad. Um, so anyway, um, the, okay, so we have the mean time to failure and we have the mean time to repair, right? And you can work out, based on these parameters, how vulnerable the RAID array is, right? Um, the, the other thing we're thinking, so the reliability creates overhead. Right? And we also talk about the overhead that's lost to the, to, to the process of creating reliability. And this is particularly important when we talk about RAID 2, right? because RAID 2 is pretty bad at this. Um, so the idea is that of my entire array, there's a portion of it that's used to provide redundancy. That portion is lost and, um, and can't be, such that it can't be recovered. Right? So that's a, a small amount of capacity degradation. It, it's potentially small. I want it to be small. right? But if it gets big, then, then uh, it's possible that my redundant array of inexpensive disks may get so big that it's not so inexpensive anymore, right? All right, so, and then, so, and in performance, actually, I, I don't want to get into this because this ends up d dwelling a lot on the details of the RAID array and how it's configured. But we, we you, know, he, you know, the nice thing about this paper is it talks about a variety of different types of workloads, right, and how they affect the RAID array. Okay, so. Now, without any further ado, let's talk about RAID 1, right? So let's talk about RAID 1, then we'll go back and talk about RAID 0. What is RAID 1? Yeah. Right. So I have two disks, and I keep them in sync, right? And it's, it's pretty awesome. He actually talks about disks with synchronous. Like, I could actually keep the heads in the same place with two disks. Yeah, I wouldn't do that anymore, I don't think. But it's, it was cool to think about. Um, but anyway, yeah, two disks. So how do I keep the disks in sync? What do I have to do? Yeah. Right. The, and this is why it's called mirroring, right? When the controller receives a request to write data, it issues that request to each disk. And I think depending on the controller, well, actually, for, for complete correctness, when can the request finish? What does that have to wait for? Every disk. Right? I cannot finish the write until the data is on every disk. Right? And so to some degree, my write performance starts to suffer a little bit because it's bounded by the slowest drive. Right? One drive might have the heads in just the right spot. The other drive's got to move them all the way across the disk. The write will, will cannot finish until both the data is on both disks right? for a synchronous write. What about reads? What's read performance like for a mirrored array? Yeah. Yeah, the cool thing about reads is there's no, remember, I'm not altering the state of the disk, right? So do, do I have to read data from both disks? No. no, I just issue the read to one disk, right? The simplest approach would be I just split the incoming reads and send them to one drive or the other drive, just back and forth, right, and return them when they're done. If I was smarter, I might keep track of where the drive's heads were and actually try to optimize the performance of the reads depending on where the drives were. So in that case, my performance actually gets better because the drive heads might be in different positions, right? But in general, you know, if, if one disk can provide a certain amount of read bandwidth, then the RAID array with two mirror drives should be able to provide about twice that, actually. So that's pretty cool, right? So mirroring. Writes, potentially a little slower. Reads, quite a bit faster. Yeah? So you could parallelize the reads? And of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that's why the read bandwidth doubles, right? Because essentially I have two independent disks here. I can read from them separately. Okay. So what is, um, let's go back to RAID 0, right? What is sometimes referred to as RAID 0? It's not mirroring. Yeah. Right, so essentially RAID 0 is just using two physical drives to look like one virtual drive. Now, all RAID does this, but I just stripe the content across both drives. Half the content is on drive 1, half the content is on drive 2, right? What about performance? What about write performance? Maybe double, depending on where the data is. If, but on the other hand, if all of my writes are going to data that's located on one disk, 
then I'm bound by that disk's write bandwidth, right? Same thing with read. So now here locality starts to matter, right? The, the, or the performance of the, of the striped or RAID 0, uh, RAID, RAID 0 isn't really RAID. I think that's why it's called RAID 0, right? There's, there's absolutely no redundancy that's, that's provided. If a disk dies, you lose roughly half of your data, right? Maybe all of it, depending on where you put it, right? You know, if you put like little bits and pieces of it everywhere when you can't reconstruct the files, then you're in deep trouble, right? Uh, so this is just for the, uh, the fearless, right? But if you have a couple of drives lying around and you don't care, go for it, right? Um, all right, so RAID 0, RAID 1, not that complicated. All right, now, now building up, so, so the, the progression of this paper is pretty cool. We have all these different RAID levels. The only thing to point out is that in, in practice, there's like two or three RAID levels that are actually in use, right? RAID 1, RAID 5, I think it's something called RAID 10 that I don't really understand, but, um, but yeah. So, so these intermediate RAID levels, as far as I know, are not really commonly used, right? But, they're, but it's a really nice conceptual framework for the paper, okay? So what is RAID 2? RAID 2 is a little, little complicated if you don't understand error codes and error correction, but what, what does a RAID 2, what does RAID 2 allow me to do? Does anybody understand RAID 2? <laughs> yeah, Natasha. Didn't it allow you to distribute your copies across different things? Right, so RAID 2 starts distributing data across multiple disks, right? Most of these approaches do this, but what does it do for error, error what does it do for fault tolerance? Yeah. Oh no, it can correct it. Actually, actually it can do both. That's the difference, right? So RAID 2 compared with the other RAID levels by applying, by essentially taking the data and applying error correcting codes to it before it's stored, RAID 2 can actually do two things. First of all, it can tell you that a drive has failed and it can correct the error, right? So as I'm reading along, and this is really all you need to know about RAID 2, is I'm reading along with the RAID 2 drive, I can actually tell from the data, right? The data will not only identify which drive has failed, but it'll allow me to reconstruct. Right. So that's pretty cool. What's the problem with RAID 2? The, the biggest problem, right, compared with the other RAID levels. Don't you have to read through all of the data to figure out exactly what error happened? Uh, I think that's part of it, but it's, it's more, it's not what I'm getting at, though. There's a, there's a, because a lot of the other RAID levels have similar features to RAID 2 in terms of error correction, but because, so RAID 2, again, can do two things. It can identify an error and correct it. Right, so RAID 2 can actually tell you when one of your disks has failed. What's the cost of doing that compared with the other RAID levels? Yeah? Well, you have that one check disk that could fail. Well, no, no, no. See, so that's the thing. It's not one check disk, right? The problem with RAID 2 is that it creates a lot of overhead, right? Because the, 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 the encoding that's applied, because I can, again, both identify errors and correct them, creates a lot of overhead, right? So the capacity of RAID 2 compared with the other RAID levels is not great, okay? So, and this is, again, really all you need to know about RAID 2. Um, so what do I do? Um, yeah, so look, if you look, overhead costs like 40%, right? So this is not fantastic, right? I'm losing a lot of the capacity of the disk to my error correction, okay? Um, so. What do I do in RAID 3? What, what is, how does RAID 3 differ from RAID 2? I'm on my way to RAID 5, baby. Halfway there. Stay with me. RAID 3, right? <laughs> RAID 2, I can identify which disk failed and correct errors. What assumption do, do I make in RAID 3? Yeah. No, but there's a, there's a big there's a big assumption I make going to RAID three. That's probably true, but I. Um, well, we assume that the disk hardware itself. Right, right. So RAID two, it's like I do a bunch of reads from disks and I combine the data together and I can tell you you're wrong, right? But come on, 
this is a hard drive. When it dies, someone's going to know, right? The controller's going to be like, hey, I haven't heard that disk in a while, right? <laughs> or, or I'm just not going to get a response when I try to issue it a request, right? So there's really no need to, to pretend that, that you know, I need to be able to identify failures. So let the, let the disk controller do that for me, right? So in RAID 3, what I assume is that the disk controller can tell me what drive has failed, right? So I don't need to worry about identifying the drive that's failed. What do I still need to do? I still need to be able to tolerate the failure, right? I have to be able to recover from it. But that actually reduces the overhead of the redundancy quite a bit, right? Because, and if you look, you know, I think, I can't remember where this goes down to, right? So essentially what I'm using now is a parity bit, right? So you imagine if I store n bits, how many people know how parity bits work? Yeah, if I store n bits, right? So say I store four bits on the four different drives, I use the fifth drive for a check bit, right? If one of the drives fails, I use the fifth drive to figure out what the failed bit should be, right? And in fact, the check bit doesn't have to copy the bit. It just has to express something about the polarity, right? So now any of the four drives that have the real bits on them can fail, and my check disk can still allow me to recover, right? So now the nice thing is I've, by relying on the disk controller, you'll see that I've reduced my overhead from 40% to 10%, right? <laughs> And actually goes down if my, as my group gets bigger, right? Because as my group gets bigger, I have, you know, 20, 24 real bits, you can think about it, and one check bit, right? So the overhead, the check bit is only always one bit, right? As the group gets bigger, that bit starts to go away, right? The overhead of that bit starts to go down, okay? Um, Oh, and then, yeah, I like this. Oh, look at these guys. They were so smart. They proposed a third level RAID system without suggesting a particular application. I like that. Yeah. You should be like, hey, it would be cool to build this thing. I don't know what it's for, but you know, maybe somebody else will find out. Um, okay. All right. What's that? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, was, and people figured out what to do. Well, yeah, the rings. Yeah. Who know? OK, so now, um, so, so the, the fourth level, so up until this point, the other thing that we've been doing is we've been assuming that in order to read data from the array, I have to read data from every disk, right? So the data is striped across the drives so that reading, um, reading data from the disk now requires contributions from every disk in the array, right? In RAID 4, essentially what I do is I say, okay, that's kind of nice, but there's a lot of cases where I might actually want a lot of independent reads and writes for certain types of workloads, right? It's probably better to allow each disk to be working independently on a read and write, right? And to be returning data independently of the other disks, right? And for certain types of workloads, this is a performance improvement, okay? And so what RAID 4 did is it said, I'm essentially gonna allow the transfer to be spread across disks in the group, right? And I'm going to use one, I'm still going to use one drive to store my, my parity check information, right? So the, the parity check, all, all the parity bits are still stored on one drive, right? All right, so now, so what's the problem with rate four? We're almost, we are almost there. Oh, this is awesome. Ah, check that out. Yeah. <laughs> These colors. <sighs> I don't know. There's still, there's still people who, you know, when you submit papers, they'll be like, it should print in black and white and be readable. I'm like, no, it shouldn't, right? There's this invention called color, right? It's been around for a while. It's really helpful like this, right? I mean, who, <laughs> who can distinguish the verticals between the semi-horizontals and the, anyway. So, um, yeah. All right, so. So now the, so, so fourth level RAID, right, allows me to distribute the I.O. better between the disks, right? That's interesting. Um, but the, but, but there's one final optimization that I can do in, in RAID 5, right? Um, all right, so we talk, it talks about small writes, right? Um, so what's the problem with four? that's solved in five, right? Four, I can, I can read from a bunch of different disks at one time, but what do I need? Well, what's the problem with four? Yeah. <sighs> yeah, so that, that, that poor check disk, right? I mean, the reads can proceed from wherever I want to, 
right? Because I'm just reading data, right? So now I can spread things all over the place, and that's awesome, right? But that check disk is, every, it gets hammered, right? Every write has to go to the check disk, right? Because writing a block of data means I need to update the parity bit, right? So what do I do in, in RAID 5 to eliminate this bottleneck? Yeah. Yeah, so essentially what I do is I, is I take that information I'm saving for redundancy and I stripe that across all the drives, right? So, you know, depending on which part of the disk I'm accessing or which block I'm, I'm accessing, the parity information for that block could be on any one of the disks, right? And so reads now essentially proceed the same as in level four RAID, but writes now still involve two drives, but now it's a random two. Right? And I don't create a bottleneck on that one poor check disk. Right? What's the other problem with, with having the check disk as a bottleneck? It's just, not just a performance bottleneck. Right? What's the other issue with it? Yeah? If it fails, you have to go through and repopulate Well, okay, if it fails, right? Yeah, Mac. Yeah, I mean, the, the, so the other thing that RAID 4 is, is failing to do, it's not just a performance thing, it's also failing to distribute the load over the disks. Right? The check disk is actually receiving many, many more write requests. So it's not just bottlenecking the system. It's also sort of the first point of failure. I mean, if you like to know which drive in your RAID array is going to fail first, then maybe RAID 4 is for you, right? <laughs> but if you prefer, you know, not to, not to, then RAID. We'll just have that be a slightly less disk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll, I'll use the sled yeah. next to the RAID array. Yeah. Right? <laughs> All right, so, and, and this is, you know, so now we've made it all the way through. This is sort of a, so this is a nice description, right? These, this is RAID 4, right? So these are my data disks, this is my check disk. Data can be on any four of the data disks. All the check bits are stored on the check disk. So reads happen from any of these disks, but writes involve always one disk and the check disk. In RAID 5, what I've done is I've taken the check information for each file. So this is, you know, one file. Here's four of the bytes. Here's the check byte. And that check information is now striped across the drives as well, right? So for example, reading this, you know, would involve reading from, you know, potentially all, all uh, three, three of these drives, but writing would also involve, well, actually, I guess these are blocks of the file. So this is the check box. So read could come from any of disks one through three and five. Writes are going to involve disk four and then one of those other drives. Right. Does this make sense to people? It's a very sort of a appealing idea. Mac. Just a quick question. Where is the data duplication on these disks? Like a particular like uh, piece of data is only in one disk and one of the disks fails. Right. So don't you lose that? Nope. Right, because this this is my redundancy right here. Right? So for example, if what what happens if disk four fails, right? So if disk four fails, I've lost, and let's pretend these are bits, right? One bit of each file. Be there, you know, you, would do, you, wouldn't do, you wouldn't do parity checks on a bit level, right? You do them on block levels, right? But, you know, pretend this is, you know, four bits, my little four bit file, right? I don't know what's in there. It's only four bits, what could it hold? Um, and here is my fifth bit, it's my check bit. So if disk four fails, right? I can recover this file by using the check bit, right? I could recover for this now for this one it looks like I have a problem, right? I lost the check bit. What do I do? I recover the check bit using the actual data, right? That's easy. You know, that, that's not a problem, right? I can always regenerate the check bit, right? Um, and then these, you know, all these other four files are the same as S here, right? I had the check bit, I used the check bit to recover the state of the bit that I lost, and I'm gold. Right. I can't. There, there's there's one other wrinkle here. I, I think there's another problem. So, so there's another problem. Um, I'm trying to remember what it is. I thought I think it's during recovery there can potentially be some. So recovering a RAID array can potentially be really ugly. Right. I mean I have to, um, and that's why you know me time to um, because for example, let's say I lose disk four. Right. Now, who cares? This force only got six bits on it, right? So it can't take that long to recover, right? But let's pretend that this actually had like a reasonable amount of data on it. Disk four fails. I put in a new disk four, and my RAID array is ready to go, right? No. 
So what has to happen, right, is I actually have to take all of the information on all of the other disks and use it to rebuild the RAID array and to recover the state of disk four, right? So when we talk, you know, I was being a little, you know, a little facetious before when I talked about the mean time to failure being, or the mean time to repair being the mean time to the guy pu plugging the drive in, right? That's not what it is. It's the mean time to that and then the process of rebuilding the RAID array. Right, this is what this calls. For, for large RAID arrays, this can take days, actually. Why, why does it take so long? Why is it so slow? I mean, whatever, just, just get the bits back there, man. All the information needs to be written on the remaining disks. Yeah, it's like the world's most IO intensive workload, right? <laughs> I have to read every bit on every disk, right? And eh, the calculation is not a problem. This is not CPU bound, right? <laughs> You know, uh, but I am the, the the overhead it creates for the array is pretty is pretty substantial, right? And so not only is there a uh, and, and not only is there a cost, and this is another reason I think that some of these uh, some of these systems try to sort of keep hot spares that have some data on them, right? Because it can reduce the time it takes to recover the array, right? Um, and and while so what, what's the other result of this, right? So how might you as a user be able to tell? that a disk in a RAID array that you use has failed and that the RAID array is being, being rebuilt. Yeah? Data's not available? No, data's available the whole time, remember? Yeah. It's slow yeah, it's slow. Performance is terrible, right? Because it's sitting, it's sitting there bottlenecked on trying to rebuild, right? So, so anyway, I mean, it's not, it's not all, you know, wine and roses. There's some, there's some kinks to it here and there, right? But this is a neat idea. Natasha. Nope. Nope. I mean, my, my, understand, my, my intuition, well, this is definitely true, right? Larger arrays take larger, take longer to rebuild, right? Um, but, you know, larger arrays also, you know, the pro again, if I, if I built, if I built, so if I built the same array, right, with, with smaller drives, I could potentially group it into parts and rebuild it a little bit faster, right? But I have more failures because I have more drives, right? So if I, if I build, so there's, there's an interesting trade-off. If I build a huge RAID array using massive drives, then failure rates are slower because I have fewer drives, but every time one fails, you better wait a week, right, before the RAID array is going to come back online. Now the, then now the array is, can be functional during this time, right? Remember, I mean, I can still uh, make updates to the, to the system, right? Um, it, it doesn't, and this is the whole point, right? I can continue to operate it. However, you know, again, any, it, it, during this period of time, there is a chance of data loss if one of the other drives is lost, right? And the amount of data you would lose would depend on how, how completely you would have been able to rebuild the array, right? To the degree that I have, that I'm replacing the data that was lost on disk four, then if disk two dies on me while I'm in process, if I've got half of it there, then that's, that's, what, that's what's left. And so you can, using similar techniques, there's probably a little, there's a little more complexity to it, you can actually build RAID arrays that can survive multiple failures, right? So you can build software RAID arrays, for example, that can survive two failures, right? Well, they actually continue to operate with two disks down, right? Um, so very similar techniques. This is, the, this is the easiest one to explain because the check bits are simple, right? Once you start needing to tolerate more than two failures, then you end up having to do a little bit more complex encodings to be able to do that. Any other questions? A good question. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, like, do you use a, like a RAID 1 within a RAID 5? Like, have, like, have a uh, I think so. It's, okay. yeah, that's I'm going to. That's how the RAID things work. I'm going to get in trouble here. There's something called RAID 10, right? Go look it up. I don't know what it is, right? It's some combination of two, it's like a two tiered RAID. So, somebody made some like maybe it's RAID one over RAID zero discs or something. I don't know. You know, it's it, 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 this is RAID, right? Like what? You know, who you know who who, who came up with it? I think there's something called RAID six. I mean, whatever. Once you start numbering things, people will come up with new numbers, right? I mean, we have like the Mach five razor, right? I mean, we're um, okay. Any other questions about RAID? All right. So reminder on Friday, there's no class. On Monday, we will talk about the Google file system, which will be very cool. So I'll see you guys then.